report and assists with special economic analysis in the department along with extension programming across Nebraska. Glennis is an Annie's project facilitator and assisted with starting the Nebraska and women, women in Agricultural program in the 1980s. In 2019, Glennis became involved in teaching communicating with farmers under stress, design for ag professionals and joined the UNL Rural Stress and Family Wellness Group to assist with related topics and curriculum. Glennis holds both a bachelor's and a master's degree from UNL. She is a founding member of the Southern Gage Kiwanis Club and was instrumental in helping to start a local fund development group, which became an affiliate of the Nebraska Community Foundation. Glennis is a farm wife and business partner on their family farm near Blue Springs, Nebraska, where they operate a breeding stock poultry facility. The next on our list is Susan Harris, a lifelong Nebraskan, serves as the serves Nebraska as the Rural Health, Wellness, and Safety Educator for Nebraska Extension. Her education includes a bachelor's degree in family and consumer sciences in, in business, as well as a master's degree in health and human performance gerontology. She has a 14-year history of education, liaison, and administrative work in health, wellness, and safety. She is a certified in mental health first aid, a psychological first aid, um, QPR, and the Michigan State University Training Program for community, Communicating with Farmers Under Stress. Susan also serves as an educator and staff member for the Nebraska Agribility Program. When she isn't traveling the state for her job, she is most likely traveling on other adventures. So welcome to you both. Thank you again for presenting and I think you're ready to rock and roll. Thank you, Emily. All right, so I guess we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. It looks like we've got folks from all across um, our country. I'm curious as to where you're from. So if you, if you want to in the chat, kind of let us know, or I guess Emily or Tess can, can tell us later where you all were from. So um, again, Susan and I are in, in Nebraska and um, we, at least where I'm at, I think Susan, I don't know. I, I don't know if she got snow this last weekend. Boy, out west, we really got, we got um, hammered. I think in our panhandle, we got quite a bit of snow, but a lot of rain and we love the rain right before the planting season comes around. So objectives for our program today is to um, talk about stress. And stress is a subject that's affecting or has affected the lives of many farmers and their families. Um, Susan and I and another colleague attended a workshop in Mich at Michigan State um, back in uh, January of 2019. Seems like ages ago. <laughs> but uh, that was an interesting time. We were actually, we headed there that day in a snowstorm. And luckily we got there. I don't know how, but we did. <laughs> anyway, um, Soon after that, that was January of 2019. In March of 2019, uh, Nebraska was hit really hard, if you recall, with the bomb cyclone. Um, that was a, um, a blizzard event. Um, we had, we had uh, you know, some real freezing weather and then we had kind of immediate melting. And so we had huge flooding issues going on. And so we found ourselves not only you know, in the midst of sort of some tough times in farming, but we also found ourselves in Nebraska in the middle of a, of a you know, a 100 to 500 year disaster relating to weather. So I recall getting back from that and well, after the, after the flood, we hadn't taken the program on the road yet from what we had learned. And I had a call from a banker in central Nebraska who was looking for some resources to help some people that were dealing with stress. And this program is designed really for those folks that work very closely with farmers. And so I explained to him that, you know, we have we just, you know, we have this curriculum and we'd love to visit with his staff and folks there in his community that we're going to be working with farmers dealing with the flooding. And I said, sir, so how soon would you like to have us present this program or would you like to host it? He goes, yes, and I need it tomorrow. So things were pretty desperate at that time. 
So in 2019, we dealt a lot with the, the flooding issue and, and all of the disaster that um, all, the, all that everybody was dealing with here in Nebraska. And then of course in 2020, we were hit with the pandemic. Who would have thought? So we're hoping that this year we don't have something major going on with us and with you too. But anyway, the objectives of this program today are four. We're going to um, talk about the awareness of stressful conditions affecting farmers. So awareness in ourselves, awareness in those around us. We're all, you know, generally you're all working with farmers or you're around farmers a lot. We'll hear about stress triggers and signs and then ways to respond. And then we'll discuss some techniques on identifying, approaching, and working with farmers who may not be coping well. And then we'll include information on resources. Of course, with the program that we've got, we've Again, we learned this program from Michigan State. We've added in information about Nebraska resources. So um, there's some definitely some great national resources. And um, you know, you, there may be some more that you can explore in your area, but it is good to be prepared for the resources that you can turn to when folks are, are uh, needing help. And Glennis, I would like to add too that um, just to clarify this program, this workshop is an hour and a half. I know some of these agribility sessions have been just an hour, but this one is 90 minutes long. We've actually condensed that. It was supposed to be um, a more a whole morning, four hours long. <laughs> so lucky you, right? You don't have to listen to us droning on for too long, but um, we, we pack a lot of information into this hour and a half. So I hope you can stick around for all of it. Also, I want to add that we are not counselors. We are not trained as counselors. We're not trying to make you counselors. This is not what this program is about. This program is about all of these objectives and just helping you deal with people who might be stressing and yourself if you are stressing. So again, we welcome um, your chat items and anything you want to interject or just interrupt us and, and um, Emily will ask us whatever questions you have. Thanks. So I think we've got it. We've got some polls. We'd like to have some interactivity from you. We want to hear from you. And so our first poll question should be on the screen. Do you see that? So there's two actually. Do you know of at least one farmer who is currently under great stress because of economic uncertainties of this business or because of a medical related matter? And then the next question is, do you believe that this farmer has adequate social and financial support from existing resources? Take a, a minute to hear your responses. And as you can probably tell, you just click right on your screen, which answer you choose. And it is anonymous. All of these polling questions are anonymous. We can't tell who answers what. So there are some personal ones later about how you react to stress and things like that. So we can't tell who you are. All right, I'll give it about five more seconds and then I'll close it down. Looks like pretty overwhelmingly though that folks do know people that are under stress. Uh, it's almost mm -hmm. like a 75-25 split. And then you're also saying that they don't have the adequate social and financial support um, from existing resources. So, um, you know, it is, it's pretty prevalent. Um, and it's interesting that as we've gone through this pandemic this last year, we hear more and more. I, I can, you can look online and read article after article about mental um, wellness or um, you know, mental um, health and wellness in you know, regarding the farm and farming community. And so um, it is, it's, and plus, not just that community, but it's everyone. We hear more about kids and the situation that we've had with schools this last year. So it really has become a topic of interest in a lot of, in a lot of situations. So. Um, I think, again, our information not only can help you and help those that are around you in the farming community, but even just in, you know, in general across, you know, um, all parts of society right now, it seems like. Okay, so, so farm stress. So we know that farming can be hard on the body and that um, I've seen stats in, um, from um, you know, the CDC has talked about at least farming Suicides um, are you know run from one and a half times higher than the national average, and I've seen as much as three to five times higher 
than the national average. So depending on the year and when the study was done, there's some different figures. But anyway, I guess the message there is that, you know, we're more likely in the farming community to think in terms of, of, of suicides. So we have the highest rates of death due to a stress-related condition. Also heart and artery disease comes into play. Heart, hypertension, ulcers, nervous disorders, you know, play a, are pretty prevalent in the farming community, as well as opioid use and misuse are concerns in rural areas as well. So making this even more of a challenge in fewer communities, you know, you, you mentioned that, um, you know, that they probably don't have the resources to turn to. And that's true. A lot of times we're, in, we're isolated, you know, where we live. Um, and, you know, you can think about in Nebraska, even just to get to the doctor in some, in some places, you know, you might be traveling an hour, two hours, um, you know, or more just to find some medical resources. So those are really, really tough. So we'll talk about later how unmanaged stress can develop into distress and distress can lead to suicide. Suicide by the ag population is higher than any other group. And, um, you know, so that's, that's kind of an important thing. So anyway, so we must learn to manage our stress levels to reduce the effects of unwanted stress. Too much stress can make a person more accident prone and affect our health and well being. This is why it's important to one, identify common stressors, recognize sy symptoms of stress and manage stress. So how many of you heard about the agrarian imperative? Dr. Roseman from the University of Iowa um, has studied and talked about this imperative for a long time. And it really has to do with how farmers um, are impelled. Um, you know, we wanna hang on to what we have. We wanna hang on to our land and our resources. And chances are they were been handed down through generations. I know the farm that we live on um, has this, we're really into our third generation now. And so, you know, yes, there's, I mean, I, I'm used to, I'm a farm wife, I'm used to a lot of the stresses that come along with, with all that we do. So think about, you know, if you would, the values that, that farmers have. And, um, you know, put some of those in the chat, if you would, right now. What do you think of when you think of a farmer and their values? We'll take a look at the chat. Anybody have any ideas? Okay, legacy. Are independent. you independent? Yeah, you go. Farm first, health last. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Strong work ethic, humility for sure. Dig in and figure it out, be strong. Yep, family business, it's business. You know, that's that's a really good point because it's not always just farmers in our rural communities. It's a, our small businesses on Main Street where those businesses have been going, you know, sometimes for generations and they're, they're faced with some of the similar kinds of things. So again, that agrarian imperative, uh, really we know sort of the values that they have and how, you know, hanging on is really important. And it's also, you know, that powerful connection that farmers have with their land and their animals. As farmers, we tr try really hard in overcoming threats. If we can't overcome the threats, we feel like failure. We try to really work hard to know um, and to keep what's been handed down from our parents and grandparents or other family members. And we feel really bad if we can't keep things together for our children. So that's so not only do we deal with a lot of things in business and stress, we have sort of that agrarian imperative that sort of looms over us and it makes it even more difficult. Um, all right, let's go on. All right, so I'm the Ag Economist. So I was brought in to work with this program kind of to look at some of the numbers. I like a lot of numbers, all right? So I'm gonna just share with you just a, very quickly a few of slides um, that sort of point to what situation we've been in sort of economically. And you can take a look, this is a national US net farm income and net cash farm income. And you can see that um, we, we definitely have our ups and our downs. And so um, we, you know, the last several years, I would say four or five years up to this point, 
you know, we've been really struggling economically. We had some higher years back in the 12, 13 um, time frame. We had a major drought in, in 2012 that it caused prices to, to increase. Um, so so we've, uh, we've got that sort of, sort of ups and downs going on, all right? And then this is a Nebraska chart, which is fine, but I wanted to show you too, again, we've been on sort of a downward slide for about four years, uh, four or five years. And now we're starting to see a little bit of an uptick, which is good news. Um, the last couple of years, we've been supported pretty heavily by government programs. Um, we've had some trade issues. We've had a lot, a number of things that have really affected, um, you know, farming income. These are just, again, kind of what's going on with prices right now. And these were updated as of February 26th. So you can see corn kind of back on a good uptick, soybeans, wheat, all of those are on a pretty good uptick tick as far as prices. You have to go clear back to that 12, 13. And we were, again, we were coming off of a drought situation in 12, which caused some of those prices to increase. But you have to go way back to find some of those higher prices. And so you can see kind of how that's um, compounded to things. And then the cattle prices, they really kind of just stay, um, you know, a little bit in the ups down. There's not a lot of change even in the last four or five years. So again, we haven't had a lot of real great gains in that area. A lot of people kind of holding on, hanging on, that kind of thing. Um, um, and last year we definitely had some, we had some down ticks because of some situations with the pandemic and meat processing, that kind of thing. So as we all know, weather can play a huge part in what's happening in that, you know, with our with our whole situation. Now, we're looking at um, lower stocks. So we're looking at lower prices or higher prices right now with our grains. Um, so, but you've got to have a crop in order to, um, you know, sell, you know, at those prices. And so um, we've been looking at some drought situations here in Nebraska. We're really thankful, very blessed to have had some rain these last few days, which I think is going to mitigate some of that. But um, again, that's, that can play a huge part. We might have the, the, the good prices, but are we going to have the crop that goes along with those good prices this year? So yeah, things are looking really a lot more positive right now, but what's the weather going to do to potentially change it? Let's hope we have a normal year. That's always that's always the hope. And I really do believe a lot of farmers are generally very optimistic. All right, I already mentioned the flooding. Okay, so price volatility can exist in farming and that really causes a lot of the, um, uh, you know, the I guess the stress factors that, that, we, that we see. And so we also um, can watch that net farm income, that net farm income screen that I showed you Again, that's the profitability. We've got to have, as an economist, we've got to have profitability um, in order to live. If we're, if we're living off of our farm business, we've got to have that in a positive sense. Because if that's negative year after year, we're not gaining, you know, we're not even able to live the way we want to live if we aren't actually making a profit. So many farms are in financial stress, putting farm families under prolonged stress and causing mental and physical health issues. So it's not always just the stress can cause the mental issues, but it can also cause physical issues, all right? So with that, I'm going to um, turn this over now to Susan to help us identify and manage stress in ourselves and in helping others. Thank you, Glynis. So yes, this next session is all about um, identifying stressors in ourselves, managing our stress, and then communicating through stressful situations. And so um, I want to ask this question, is stress ever good? What do you think? It actually can be good. There's this thing called eustress. It's spelled E-U-S-T-R-E-S-S. -E -S -S. And I'm, I'm getting a little feedback, Glennis. I don't know if that's you or what. You might want to mute. I'm not sure who, unless somebody else isn't muted. Thank you. Um, so you stress is uh, when we have, so, so first of all, stress, the, the kind of stress that we think about is this need or demand that uh, we perceive as burdensome or threatening. And it can lead to, as Glenna said, mental health and physical problems. And a lot of the times we forget about that physical part or we aren't aware of that physical part. So we're really going to talk about that and stress that today. Um, but there is this thing called you stress that 
Uh, it, it builds up our cortisol levels just enough to meet a challenge, to get through that issue and then move on with life. And then our cortisol levels in our bloodstream goes down back to normal, less stressed. Well, it's when that cortisol stays up high that we have chronic stress and um, chronic stress is what gets us. And some of these things um, on this list can definitely cause chronic stress. Some of it can be acute stress, which is sudden and, and it goes away quickly, but a lot of them are chronic, especially you know, weather, you might consider that as acute. It happens when it happens, but man, lately it's just been a chronic issue, all kinds of different weather issues. Large debt loads, that's something that most farmers take on uh, to expand their farm operations. And um, this is a constant load in their mind, um, as well as financially. Government regulations. I interrupt, I'm sorry, there's a that's question. Okay. Uh -huh. um, there's a question, and I think it probably goes actually back to Glennis, but um, it's from Joseph Castine, and it says, I'm a novice to this. How do these variables cross over from family farms versus the larger industrial corporations? I, I think there's a lot of interrelationship, definitely. So if there's, if there's issues that are caused or issues that are happening with some of the to say the processors, that has a ripple effect back to the farmer. Um, and so I'm not, I guess I'm not sure of the question exactly, but I mean, the example this last year with the meat packing situation where we had COVID, uh, we had some shutdowns with that and there was a ripple effect in the market and that really caused some, I mean, uh, some, uh, you know, some real concern, you know, in the farming community for sure. So I think that's kind of what, what you're getting at is that, um, you know, we, it's all, there's just a lot of interdependence, you know, we've got to have the processing going on, um, and, you know, and we've got to have the market for our crops and our livestock. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Um, so on to these more stressors, machinery breakdown, that tends to be more acute and sudden and it costs a lot of money and then um, they have to move on. High interest rates, that's um, you know hit and miss, it changes, it does fluctuate. Crop yield, that's always a concern, right? This is, this is in relationship to paying bills and livelihoods and keeping the farm alive. So that's a big stressor. Livestock illness could be a sudden or acute issue, but it could also, if it spreads um, throughout the herd, it could be something that is ongoing and a chronic stress at, at that time. Commodity prices, we know that's chronic in farmers and ranchers. They're usually glued to the TV at noon for the report or listening to the radio for the commodity reports every day, um, 365 days a year. And for those of you who, are involved with farming and you are involved with farming with your family members, I, I think you'll probably agree that it's um, disagreement with family members is a chronic issue. I hear that a lot with family owned farms. And one that I would like to add that Michigan State did not put in here. And by the way, if you have others that you can think of, please put them in the chat. I'm curious if we're missing some, but the one that came to mind for me because I have been self-employed before is that health insurance premium. The cost of health insurance uh, as a, an independent self-employed person is astronomical and then you have to pay a high deductible, which means that you try to avoid going to the doctor when you should, which means that your health goes down because you're avoiding these things and that impacts your stress level because your physical health definitely walks hand in hand with stress. Susan, this plays into what you just said, but there was a comment that health issues or injuries make a huge impact on stress. So absolutely yes. going back to that health. health. And, and also, as we know in agribility, for the caregivers, it's not just impacting that one person who is, who is hurt. It's impacting the whole family, the whole operation. Very good. Thank you. There was a comment earlier, too, that... Um, 40 hour work week is meaningless to farmers. So if you can imagine, yeah, we just, they don't take the breaks, you know, also that can add to the stress. Yep. Day after day. They work much more than 40 hours per week for the most part. So for sure. So the, the emphasis of that last slide was to tell us that, you know, those of us in cushy jobs, like, like I have, I consider my job cushy compared to what a farmer or a rancher does. 
Uh, by the way, when we say farmer, and I know some of you might be ranchers, we're not trying to offend anyone by just using one term or the other. We try to use them both. This curriculum specifically is named farmers, but we are, we are speaking to everybody. Um, but anyway, uh, those of us with jobs like, like I have don't have to deal with most of the things on that, that list. So if any of you are not in farming and you're seeing that, that screen with all those stressors, just imagine if you had to deal with all those in addition to your job. It's a lot. So this next slide. Another, sorry, Susan. Yes, go ahead. Some other things that just got put in the chat box are hiring labor is another big stressor, as well as the cost of insurance also relates to many who are forced to work off farm to obtain employer paid yep. medical coverages. Exactly. You hear that all the time. They have to get a job in town to, to pay for health insurance big time. Yeah, good stuff. All right, so we have a video that Ryan's going to queue up and play here for us, and I'm warning you that it's weird. This video is so weird. People have often said to us, that is the weirdest thing, but you know what? It's stuck in my mind after I saw it, and I think it'll stick in yours, and it has a good message about what stress does to us physically that maybe we're not considering. Cramming for a test? Trying to get more done than you have time to do? Stress is a feeling we all experience when we are challenged or overwhelmed. But more than just an emotion, stress is a hardwired physical response that travels throughout your entire body. In the short term, stress can be advantageous, but when activated too often or too long, your primitive fight or flight stress response not only changes your brain, but also damages many of the other organs and cells throughout your body. Your adrenal gland releases the stress hormones cortisol, epinephrine, also known as adrenaline, and norepinephrine. As these hormones travel through your bloodstream, they easily reach your blood vessels and heart. Adrenaline causes your heart to beat faster and raises your blood pressure, over time causing hypertension. Cortisol can also cause the endothelium, or inner lining of blood vessels, to not function normally. Scientists now know that this is an early step in triggering the process of atherosclerosis, or cholesterol plaque buildup in your arteries. Together, these changes increase your chances of a heart attack or stroke. When your brain senses stress, it activates your autonomic nervous system. Through this network of nerve connections, your big brain communicates stress to your enteric or intestinal nervous system. Besides causing butterflies in your stomach, this brain-gut connection can disturb the natural rhythmic contractions that move food through your gut, leading to irritable bowel syndrome, and can increase your gut sensitivity to acid making you more likely to feel heartburn. Via the gut's nervous system, stress can also change the composition and function of your gut bacteria, which may affect your digestive and overall health. Speaking of digestion, does chronic stress affect your waistline? Well, yes. Cortisol can increase your appetite. It tells your body to replenish your energy stores with energy-dense foods and carbs causing you to crave comfort foods. High levels of cortisol can also cause you to put on those extra calories as visceral or deep belly fat. This type of fat doesn't just make it harder to button your pants. It is an organ that actively releases hormones and immune system chemicals called cytokines that can increase your risk of developing chronic diseases such as heart disease and insulin resistance. Meanwhile, stress hormones affect immune cells in a variety of ways. Initially, they help prepare to fight invaders and heal after injury. But chronic stress can dampen the function of some immune cells, make you more susceptible to infections, and slow the rate you heal. Want to live a long life? You may have to curb your chronic stress. That's because it has even been associated with shortened telomeres, the shoelace tip ends of chromosomes that measure a cell's age. Telomeres cap chromosomes to allow DNA to get copied every time a cell divides without damaging the cell's genetic code, and they shorten with each cell division. When telomeres become too short, 
a cell can no longer divide, and it dies. As if all that weren't enough, chronic stress has even more ways it can sabotage your health, including acne, hair loss, sexual dysfunction, headaches, muscle tension, difficulty concentrating, fatigue, and irritability. So, what does all this mean for you? Your life will always be filled with stressful situations, but what matters to your brain and entire body is how you respond to that stress. If you can view those situations as challenges you can control and master, rather than as threats that are insurmountable, you will perform better in the short run and stay healthy in the long run. Okay, so I told you it was weird. I was right, right? But every time I see that video, it reminds me of things that I need to keep in mind. So I hope it does that for you. By the way, we will have these, these PowerPoint slides available for you so you can um, have all this information later. So, you know what, I'm gonna go back one before I hit that one. I wanna, I wanna tell you about Dr. John Shetsky, and I think Ryan has an article that he's gonna put in the, the chat by Dr. John Shetsky from uh, Wisconsin Extension, I believe. Anyway, I love his, his take on stress, and the article that he's putting in the chat is how you can relate your stress to a, a piece of farm machinery, and how you, know, you wouldn't put that lousy fuel into an expensive combine, just like you shouldn't put lousy things into your body if you want your body to work. Um, but John has a great analogy that I wanna tell you about. He said, thousands of years ago, a person who stumbled upon a saber-toothed tiger or other predator would be more likely to survive the encounter if he or she was able to spring up and sprint away swiftly. An increase in blood pressure and heart rate and a slowdown of digestive processes meant more energy could be directed toward escaping these threats. If they couldn't run quickly enough, the odds of surviving if wounded by the hungry tiger were better if their blood clotted quickly. So here we are thousands of years later with that same biological makeup and we know that having stress means that cortisol increases sugar in the bloodstream. So like I said before, it can motivate us to ask to act, it can create that use stress, which is a good stress. However, when that cortisol stays in our system and it stays elevated, um, it can have detrimental effects on our health, like uh, blood clots, moods, fears, uh, our immune system, our digestive system, all those things that you just saw in that video. So I really wanna emphasize to you that stress manifests itself physically so often. Um, a lot of times in respiratory situations and farmers and ranchers. So just keep that in mind. Um, I'm gonna have you look at this chart and kind of think of how you typically react to stressful situations. Um, I'm gonna put another poll up here. And remember this is anonymous. Let's see, stop sharing results. Let's see if I can find the next. There we go, I'll find it, there we go. So my question to you is what signs and symptoms do you predominantly see in yourself when you are stressed? And while you're, while you're answering, I'm gonna tell you another little story about these workshops that we do. We've done, I don't know, 25 so far, Glenn is something like that. And in one of them, actually in three of them, there was a gal who came to three different sessions of it. She had experienced some trauma in her life and she was very interested in the topic. So she went to one, she went to the second one. And at the third one, we got to this, this scene, this, this slide. And she raised her hand and she said, I have to tell you something. She said, my teenage daughter was experiencing all these physical problems. And we took her to the doctor, doctor after doctor, specialist after specialist, trying to figure out what was wrong with her and what was going on. And she said, we just couldn't figure it out. And she said, one night, my daughter said, mom, I'm really stressed about this test that's coming or something that she was stressed about. And when she said the word stressed, this gal said, the light bulb went off over my head and I was sitting back in your workshops and I remembered what you said about how stress manifests itself physically. So it was at that point, we took her to a behavior, behavioral health specialist and she got the help that she needed mentally 
and all of her physical problems went away. I love that story. So just keep that kind of thing in mind. Okay, what symptoms do you predominantly see in yourself? Let's share your answers here. A lot of you are physical, 51%, 24% emotional. Some of you act out or increase drinking or isolate yourselves. Cognitive is, is 12%. That's kind of mine. I kind of get into a weird zone cognitively and self-worth, um, feeling like a failure, not being able to fix things, all very legitimate. And you see, they're kind of all over the board. So I'm gonna stop sharing that. By the way, if you still have this little screen on your, on your screen, you can just click the X and it goes away. Um, what I wanted to emphasize there is that everybody is different. And when we are live in person and we have you in a room, we will put you in small groups to talk about this and compare how you react to stress to how other people in your group react to stress. Never once have we ever had any group say, yeah, we all reacted the same. We all have the same exact symptoms. Everyone has different symptoms. So this is our way of telling you to keep that in mind when you're talking with farmers and ranchers or people in your family or people you work with. Think about the fact that they probably don't react to stress the same way you do. Just because I have difficulty concentrating, you know, other people might be fine with that, but they might lash out and act in a different way. So if you see any of these symptoms in anyone, maybe just step back. And, and my, favorite, uh, my favorite slogan is be curious, not furious. You might consider, hey, maybe they're just having some chronic stress. Yeah, that, that should have gone earlier, that slide. Okay, so what does stress look like in a farmer or a rancher? These are just some typical things um, that Michigan State has, has laid out for us. So a change in routine, that's, that's true for about anyone who is experiencing chronic or prolonged stress. Uh, if they are usually at the donut shop every morning having coffee with the guys and they're suddenly just kind of hit and miss or not showing up at all, that's a change in routine. Um, the care of their livestock might be declining. You might see some neglect going on. Again, physically it could be manifesting itself. So they might have increased illnesses or injuries. Definitely injuries and accidents can happen because when you're stressed, you tend to lose sleep um, and that can cause you to um, you know, not be able to make the right decisions for safety. Um, an increase, let's see, appearance of farmstead might decline if they used to be all over the mowing and, and the landscaping and suddenly it just starts to kind of look cruddy. That's a definite sign. And they might, uh, you, they might have children who are showing signs of stress uh, by not doing homework or, you know, not showing up at school or, or even, having some physical abuse going on. So how to handle stress. And before we look at that, I have one more poll for you. Just because it's fun, we like to keep you hopping. I want to know how you handle your stress. How do you cope with your stress? And we will talk about, of course, the healthier ways to do it, but I'm wondering, um, honestly, how do you usually react if you have a chronically stressful situation? We have a lot of talking to friends and family. That's usually the top answer. That's good. You know what I would be really interested to know is how many of you on this webinar are actually farmers and ranchers? Because if we had an audience of farmers and ranchers, I have a feeling the working one would be higher. At least that's what, it, that's what has shown us in um, surveys and things that we've done at farm events. So this is interesting. Wow, and so far 28 of you are practicing healthy habits to deal with your stress. Good for you. Susan, someone said in the comments they would like to see eating 
being a method of coping and then mm -hmm. um, wondering if meditation should be another option for you guys. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we will be talking about that. By eating, I wonder if you mean eating in an unhealthy way, because some, some people do stress eating or eating in a healthy way. I'm assuming they mean stress eating. Yeah, so you'll notice um, talking to the healthcare doctor or counselor is really low on the list. It usually is, and especially in the farm and ranch community, in the rural communities. For one, they don't necessarily have those resources, and two, they, they're they just a proud bunch, and they're probably not going to be going to a counselor. So this is why talking to friends and family should rank up there, and we should really uh, emphasize having a support system. Awesome. A lot of you have hobbies, too. Very good. And I think that's why it's made it really hard with the pandemic. I, I think of myself and I think, well, yeah, I've really kind of just poured myself into work and, um, you know, really not mm -hmm. been that connected, which I know is really bad, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to, you know, connecting as we normally um, sort of have with our friends and definitely family, our extended family. We have nieces and nephews that were born this last year, of course, that we haven't met yet. No, I know that's just... It's so sad. So I think it's it's kind of, you know, quadruple thing. It's, it is. It's important to remember that social connections are, are really important, and we will talk about that, too. I'm going to um, stop sharing. Yes. In, in the chat, there's a couple things that say it's definitely stress eating for sure. One says, mm -hmm. I'm a farmer and an AgriAbility staff member. Prayer and worship awe and spiritual support is my go-to stress relief, and that is the case for many farmers around me also. Another one says stress is very circular. It causes symptoms that cause more stretch, stress, which causes more symptoms, etc. So positive mm -hmm. outlets are such an important part of his life. And then um, again, just again, meditation. So very good. Thank you. That is excellent input and also true. So true. So some of the things that Michigan State uh, emphasized for handling stress. Uh, are right here. The first one is something that we just take for granted. And since taking this course from Michigan State, I have learned how truly important and research-based deep breathing is. So I'm going to give you a very simple one. First of all, I'll tell you the one that they recommended that we teach you, and that is called box breathing. So when you're feeling this chronic stress and you're, you're, you're needing some control, um, it's helpful to imagine a visual box in front of you and Breathe in while you count to four. One, two, three, four. Hold it. Two, three, four. Breathe out. Two, three, four. Hold it. Two, three, four. So this is good not only for a distract distraction because you're visually imagining this box in front of you. Um, in your mind, you're counting, so that's distracting you. You're controlling it. You're, you're doing good things for your diaphragm and all your systems um, related to breathing. It is truly one of the best things that you can do. And it's one of the easiest things that you can to do to help handle stress. My favorite one, um, since I learned about more about deep breathing is to count up to four as I breathe in and count to six as I breathe out because the longer exhale relaxes your whole system that you have. It's, it's a big, long scientific story that I have not memorized and I'm not gonna to explain to you today, but I have learned that scientifically that relaxes you. While if you do it the other way, uh, if you inhale longer than you exhale, that tends to pump you up if you wanna get psyched up and excited for something. But to relax, you exhale longer than you inhale. Self-talk is crucial. Um, I. I hope that you all talk to yourself the way that you talk to others. You know, I, I hope that you wouldn't say to your friend, you idiot, why did you do that? I can't believe you did that. You probably wouldn't say that to other people, but you might say it to yourself. So try to work on maybe not doing that so much. I can figure this out. I have, I got this, I can do this, that kind of thing. Meditating, yes. Again, someone mentioned meditating. And if you all have suggestions for different ways that you meditate, please put them in the chat. This can be anything from taking a walk, being in nature, um, like you said, prayer, um, apps. If you have a good app that you like to use, put that in the chat. So many different ways to meditate. Meditating is just being present in the moment and focusing on, on, on that moment and not the things that are flying around elsewhere. 
Exercise, foods, and sleep. These are crucial, again, because our physical state impacts our mental state and vice versa. Um, I always say it's not real food if my grandma didn't eat it 100 years ago. So we should stop and consider our processed foods that we're eating. If you aren't active, uh, your brain has no reason to want to sleep. And if you don't sleep, you're fatigued and you have more stress, et cetera, et cetera. It's a vicious circle. So exercise is good. By the way, I'm going to stand up right now. I hope you do too. We always uh, recommend this in the middle of our program and maybe several times during the program to stretch your legs because you should never sit more than an hour. Uh, so sleep, that's my passion. Those of you who know me know that uh, that's the main thing that I teach in extension. And I believe Ryan put in the chat box the link to my 30 tips and tricks for sleeping. If you have issues with sleeping, I could do a whole eight hour presentation on that, but I won't today. Um, so that's your little bonus today. You get that, those, those tips that you can keep. We talked about social networks and how important it is for people to have a social network, just talking to people, sharing stories, um, you know, sharing your problems, getting advice, that kind of thing is so important in handling your stress. And last but not least, speaking with a mental health professional um, is recommended as well, especially for some serious problems. Um, Susan, some forms of me media, uh, meditation that they recommended are relaxation, hypno hypnosis, oh, wow. um, insight timer mediation or meditation app, excuse me, um, laughter is the best medicine. Again, yes. that insight meditation app. They also have live classes on that app. And then, um, someone says when folks say pride is the reason egg industry doesn't outreach to others. I think this can be seen as a negative and it's not like pride in a negative way. It's based on being raised to be self-reliant and independent and not to burden others with your worries. I think this is a different spin we should look at and not so much pride and the negatives associated, associated mm -hmm. with pride. And then when stressed is good to relax from the feet up also helps with understanding that pain caused to your body from the feet up or caused by stress. So this is so good. I love your input. You guys are the best audience ever. Thank you for that. That is so true. All of it. I wish I could go into depth on every single thing that you mentioned there, but thank you. That was great. Um, what else? So at this point, you might be wondering, why are we talking so much about stress within ourselves? You know, we, I came on this webinar to learn how to talk to farmers and ranchers about their stress. Well, what we have learned throughout this workshop is that uh, this can be really helpful in our own lives and in working, with, uh, dealing with our family members and our coworkers and other people that we do deal with. And just understanding that we all are dealing with something and we all deal with it differently. That's kind of the hard part. We kind of expect other people to behave the way that we behave and it doesn't happen that way. So again, identifying your support system is crucial, especially for farmers and ranchers because they are isolated out there physically. Um, and it has been proven that those with better support systems have lower depression. And something to think about in whatever organization you work with or whatever you do in life is what can you do to help create these support systems for the farmers and ranchers? Social events, yeah, we can't really do that yet, but soon, hopefully, coffee talks, opportunities to bring people together, um, anything you can do like that would be really helpful. Even just going out and visiting farmers and ranchers, texting, calling, keeping in touch, that kind of thing. I know Glennis is gonna talk more about that. And like that person in the chat mentioned, break down the stigma. That is a huge goal that we should all have. Mental health is just as important as physical health. It's not a bad word, it's something that we need to work on. All right, so I believe this is Glennis's turn. It is. So really in the last half of this program now, we're gonna talk about really how do you communicate, how do you work with someone that um, you sense might be, you know, might be having, um, or you're trying to find out, I guess, sort of how stressed they are. And then Susan's going to cover, um, you know, sort of really how you deal with somebody that's in a distress mode. Okay. So my part of the program right now, I'm going to talk with you about approaching a person who is under chronic stress. 
All right. So there we know that there's lots of chronic stressors when it comes to farming and ranching. So, so how many of you would feel comfortable and confident if you needed to intervene with a farmer who sensed you were severely stressed? In the next few minutes, we'll talk about preparing to approach someone who seems to be under great stress and beginning the dialogue to find out the pro what the problem is. And we'll focus on the process of active listening. And research and experience tells us that listening can be the most valuable action you can take in the situation. So it's all about sort of being a good listener. And the most useful form of listening is active listening, which I say is really listening and sort of putting that caring approach behind our listening. So we'll suggest some things to do and not to do when you're in a tight situation. And we'll talk about how to prepare an action plan briefly as well. So this again was designed for those of you that are resource people that work with farmers and ranchers one-on-one. -on -one. Um, it could be the banker, you, you and AgriAbility that work with uh, you know, farmers and ranchers, um, you know, as counselors, you know, any of those types of things. Okay. But again, yeah, let's think of, let's think if you were a banker or a resource person, um, you know, that traveled the country and visited with farmers and ranchers. And so as you prepare for meeting up with someone, you really want to think about sort of your game plan. So what are you going to do? Are you going to be talking about the crops? Are you going to be looking at the livestock? Are you really working with someone that's thinking of transitioning, of selling? You know, it just depends on, you know, really what, what you're up against and what reaction, what you're going to plan for. So you'll want to spend some time thinking about what you're going to do to help this person if, um, again, there's some questions that come up that you can't handle, that type of thing. So we'll go ahead with the next. Here's a, a list of questions of just kind of helping you prepare there, okay? So it's important as we think about the process and you plan, you're planning about going in with, with, with whatever, is that you think about your mindset. So again, it varies as to our role. Um, um, you know, what is your mental posture and what, what do you bring to the situation? So we're gonna watch a short video that I really enjoy. I think it really helps a lot in demonstrating and talking about empathy versus sympathy. So I'll let Ryan go ahead and, and cue this up. So kind of think about the differences between empathy and sympathy as you listen to this video, all right? So what is empathy and why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's a, it, very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, and climb down. I know what it's like down here, and you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. <laughs> uh, no, you want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time. Because you know what? Someone just shared something with us that's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. 
But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now. I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. Okay, so in this video, you heard um, you know, the difference between sympathy and empathy. So can you put it in your own terms, really what that means? And I really have to think about this as we, you know, we lose, or we, let's say we send out sympathy um, cards to folks. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think that's a, that's a common thing that we do, um, but I always have to think about, you know, really um, what's it like in their shoes? I don't know, I don't know um, in many cases. Is it, you know, in the case of losing a child or something like that, um, it's just, it's, we're trying to understand and be in their shoes. Um, we're trying to, um, I mean, sympathy kind of, sympathy is sort of, sort of a pity type of, type of response. So, Christina, so the big thing. Christina yeah, put in the chat, standing with someone. I like that. Just being standing with someone. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. And like I said earlier, it's, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, um, really showing that we care, you know, as we're trying to communicate with someone. So, um, and one more, one more, like Kathy says here, an answer is not always needed. Just showing your feelings, but an answer yeah. is not necessarily what they're after. Very yeah. good. Okay. So again, think in terms of if, if your client or someone that you work with needs answers and they need to play an active role in coming up with those answers um, to ensure a level of commitment going forward. So is it something that you can say, here's your, here's what you need to do. You know, no, it's really, you're trying to guide them to come up with some of the answers themselves. So do you know someone that's facing a difficult situation, conflict and stress may be building? I'm sure you all do, or that's why you're on here today. Be prepared to start the conversation with something that is related to the relationship that you've already built with them, okay? Be empathetic to their situation. So asking questions like, you know, how are you sleeping? How are you dealing with the situation? Um, anything that's sort of behavioral related. And they may be more likely to answer these questions first rather than mentioning, mentioning stress. So communicating through conflict involves dialogue. That was the last screen. <laughs> dialogue that is open, honest. It involves a lot of listening. It takes practice. So first you wanna preserve the relationship, tell the facts and impacts on yourself and others, without judgment or blame. That's a key thing, without judgment or blame and how you're talking about these things. Explain the outcome you want. I'd really like us to resolve this in a way that works for both of us, particularly works for you, but hopefully works for both of us. And ask for other views. How do you see, see the situation and what am I missing? Okay, just to kind of get things started, develop a shared purpose and resolving in the end. Okay, so Michigan State put together this active listening um, continuum. And I think it's really helpful. You think back, um, helpful. You, if you think back to your communication classes that you had, I always remember these, these continuums and how we communicate and so on. But I think this is a good one. If you know Stephen Covey, if you remember back, he said, most people do not listen with the intent to understand. They listen to with the intent to reply. I think we're, I mean, many of us are guilty of that. I know I'm guilty of that. I'm always like, hmm, how can I, you know, profoundly answer this question or, you know, um, and I'm, I'm thinking ahead versus really listening to somebody oftentimes. So on the active listening continuum, the first four points on this continuum is you're asking and you're trying to understand. Basically, this is you're being curious, okay? So asking is where the conversation starts. It's when you're, someone is invited to say something through voice or another commitment communication mode, and you know how it is, often we're thinking, how am I gonna respond? Kind of what Stephen Covey said, and we don't get things rolling good with this. Ask is where the conversation generally starts. Probing is a way to gently gather more information to help one understand. Like, I'd like to know more. 
The next one is attending. And that's really trying to pay attention and watch and pay attention to nonverbal cues, body language, eye contact, you know, or the lack thereof. You know, if they're just kind of looking down and, you know, not very engaged, you know, you can kind of pick up on sort of what's going on there. Glennis, so, sorry, to, Glennis, I'm sorry, this is Emily. Sorry to interrupt. Um, we have a question. Can you say something that you possibly said again? It was listen to and listen with intent to blank versus. To understand, to understand. Okay. So most of us, we uh, do not listen with the intent to understand. We listen with the intent to reply. So we're always thinking, trying to think ahead of what am I going to say next? Right. Okay. Awesome. And there was also one that says the U.S. Marine Corps and the VA system has developed a training to create a peer group um, called Qualified Listener to Learn Active Empathetic Listening Skills. Great. That's a wonderful resource. Thank you. Yeah, yep. kind of exactly what we're on to here. OK, so our next our next um, item of the first four points is restating. And that's simply repeating what one thing was said, sort of. Um, we're saying it in verbatim back to them, okay? So again, these first four points, we're asking and we're trying to understand. We're listening for trigger words and what perspective do they have? And again, you can see the word empathy there. We're trying to use some empathy to understand where they're coming from, okay? So the next three phases of the active listening continuum assertively validates a person's feelings. Okay, so the first one there is paraphrasing, and that's using your own words now to repeat what the speaker said. So we're saying it in a different way. Like, in other words, I'm hearing you say, you said this, is, did I hear that right? So you're kind of checking in with kind of where they're at. And the next um, listening um, continuum item is summarizing. And that is paraphrasing and adding the emotion that seems to be expressed by the speaker. So from what you're saying, I sense that you're feeling, gosh, really down and out. You're just feeling really isolated. Is that right? Okay. Reframing then is the last one on the continuum. And that is to state in a natural or neutral or unbiased term what one thinks the speaker really wants or needs. I'm hearing that you'd like this to happen, is that right? And it takes practice to reframe. So we've gone through this whole continuum and we're, we're really trying to be empathetic, really trying to be a good listener, listener listening with hearing. And you know, it takes a lot of practice to really understand where someone's coming from. And I think this is a good one. Life does not move in a straight line and neither does a good conversation. So this is, I've got it straight there, but you could probably put it all over the board. We might be really good at asking, we might be really good at restating, you know, but when it comes to reframing and really figuring this out, it can be really difficult. So develop a shared purpose and resolve. Should you tell someone the solution again? No, um, you know, commit to stay in a dialogue by saying, are you willing to uncover other, the other's interest and what do you want and reframe a mutual purpose? How can we satisfy both your needs and mine? What do we both care about? And you can help somebody brainstorm um, situations. So phrases you might use in active listening, there's some examples there. Um, we're trying to build trust and rapport and demonstrate concern. You can see those bullets. And we haven't mentioned this yet, but we've got a website where we're going to, we're gonna share that website with you from UNL. And on there we have, there is just a ton of resources and handouts that come along with this program. Um, and there's one on how to talk to farmers under stress. And this particular handout will give you some good examples, again, to um, sort of learn from. Here's some ideas on the screen um, as we're you know, really trying to actively listen. But there's some more information in this handout, how to talk with farmers under stress. And so, like I say, you'll, you'll get that link and we hope that you can utilize the resources that we have on that. So, um, continuing on. So our stressful situations, um, you know, what to do. We're starting to pick up, you know, that there's a stressful situation. Um, and I know of several farms in similar situations. Sometimes it is, I, we have these little cards and I don't know if Susan will talk about those later. 
but I really, really like them. It's kind of like in the farming situation, sometimes it helps us feel better maybe to think that, hey, I'm not the only one going through what we're going through. Like we know when the flooding hit Nebraska, you know, there were people understood that they weren't the only ones. I mean, it was severe, it was a horrible impact on a lot, but you know, sometimes just bringing their attention to that, you know, they're not the only ones in that situation. Every, every situation though is a little different and I need to understand better. So these are, these are just comments and things that you can make. And have you thought about, and I could maybe help with, you can see some of the ideas here. And like I said, you can be a facilitator to help them think in terms of the pros and cons. And as we know, sometimes writing those things down, talking about the positives and the negatives and what we can do, um, you know, can really help the situation a lot. So um, more do's. So again, if you're in a, depending on your role, and if you're starting to pick up and you know that somebody's been sort of in a stressful situation, it's really, really important that if you tell them that you're going to follow up, that you do it. And even if you didn't tell them that you'll follow up, you, you know, you, you will go ahead and do that. You'll check back in with them. So again, think about your current role. And obviously we don't want to overpromise. Uh, we want to be able to, to act upon what we can individually do to help them in this situation. All right, so I'm going to have um, Susan get back to us now on the relationship between chronic stress and suicide. Okay, thank you, Glennis. So it is true that there is a relationship and humans um, can handle two major stressors. And by major stressor, I'm talking about a birth, a death, a move, a new job, major stressor in your life. It's when that third stressor hits that um, a lot of us tend to crack. So if you know someone who maybe is experiencing at least three stressors, um, it can be a really difficult time. And it can be a very... Um, Gosh, it can seem very hopeless. You know, I, if you've ever been through depression, you, you understand that you just feel trapped. You feel helpless and hopeless and like there's no solution. And it's hard. It's like having blinders on. It's difficult to see the answers. So before we get into this, um, I will tell you that this is going to be about having awkward conversations. Nobody likes to do that. I'm one of those people. Confrontation is bad enough for me, but awkward conversations, oh my gosh. However, this course has taught me some things that I have, have put into use, uh, and I hope that maybe you will too. Uh, first of all, you will not hear me say uh, someone committed suicide. That is something that we don't like to use that term because you know people also commit crimes, and we don't like to use that sort of negative um, meaning to it. Now, I ask you that you put aside all of your, your religious views. If you think that suicide is a horrible, horrible thing and you do have views on it like that, or if you, know, you just have a real negative thought about suicide, just try to put that aside for a moment as we talk about this, um, because we need to really think about it neutrally. And especially if you're talking to a stressed person, uh, it's, it's easy to spout your opinions not realizing that this person might be having thoughts of suicide. So um, we want you to oh, so yeah, it. Oh, I hear some, hang on here. There we go, I'm gonna. Nope, ask to unmute, nope, I'm not asking to unmute. Well, Ryan or someone, I'm gonna ask you to try to mute whoever is, I can hear somebody. If, if you're not on mute, I would ask you to, to, to Click mute if you would, thank you. Uh, so anyway, we don't say uh, committed suicide. We don't say successful suicide because a, a suicide is never successful. Um, we do say die by suicide or they took their own life. And, and again, just because you never know who's considering suicide. So it's best to speak of it in a neutral form. So these are some suicide warning signs. Talking or writing about suicide or death is a big one. Uh, I know that some people tend to get their apologies out before they know that they are going to take their own life. They, they tend to um, talk about it and drop hints about it in hopes that maybe someone will pick up on that. 
feeling hopeless, trapped, or like a burden, which I mentioned, especially uh, in depression. If they start giving away their prized possessions, that's a definite sign. They're not going to use them anymore because they're not going to be on this earth anymore. Making a plan and acquiring means. And by that, um, that's one of the things we ask you to do. If, if someone is contemplating suicide, that's one of the first questions you ask is, do you have a plan? And if they have a plan, if they've purchased a pistol or whatever their plan is, then you know it's serious. Again, saying goodbyes, making apologies, making things right with people, isolation from others. And in this time of a pandemic, that's really difficult to see because we are all isolated. Uh, but if you see it more than usual, that's a sign loss of interest in things that, that they used to love, hobbies or people, or like I said, going to the coffee shop every day and chatting with the guys. If they're not showing up, uh, that could be a sign. And mood change, of course, that seems really obvious, but we, what we might not be considering is that if they have been grouchy and going kind of downhill in terms of their mood over the past weeks or months, and suddenly they show up very happy for no apparent reason, uh, it's a red flag because that could also mean that they have thought about it. They've made their decision. They're going to take their life and end all of their problems. And that is their solution. And that makes them happy. So these are some examples of warning sign statements. I'm not going to read through all of them. I'll just let you look at those. Some of them can be clear. Some of them can be coded. And it's those coded ones you have to watch out for. You have to listen for. Uh, like I said, I, since learning about this in this curriculum, I have had two conversations with people where I have actually used this statement that's coming up that I'm going to tell you about that you can ask. If you hear some of these kinds of sentences and you are concerned about what they're thinking, this might help you recognize that. You know, before I may not have ever recognized these kinds of things, but you know, you'll need to look after your mother when I'm gone. That's a, that's a, a coded sign that they're thinking about being gone. So what does that mean? Could that mean that they're thinking of taking their own life? And as one of those says, there might be zero warning signs. So many people feel guilt after someone that they know takes, uh, takes their life because they should have seen the signs. Well, you, they, there aren't always signs, but typically these are, are some signs that you might see. So I mentioned that we will tell you this one sentence that you can use. I urge you to write this down. I urge you to practice this. And I urge you to use this if you ever hear any of those or, or uh, symptoms or, or sentences that we just talked about. Anything that we've talked about, if anything concerns you, this is a good sentence to say. Are you having thoughts of suicide? Not, are you thinking of killing yourself? Not, are you gonna commit suicide? Not with that attitude, not with that tone of voice, but this is a sentence that allows you to say it very neutrally. Are you having thoughts of suicide? And then that can develop into the next conversation. And I have used that twice with two different people. Both times I was so glad that I asked and both times they were so grateful that I asked and that I cared enough to ask. Uh, it, it turned out to be the answer was no both times, but I was really glad I asked. So what if the answer is yes? That's where people struggle. What do we do? And by the way, yes, as it says, it doesn't risk, it, it doesn't increase the risk of suicide if you ask. Oh, and before I get to what, what if they say yes, I think Ryan has a link that I asked him to put in the chat box for Kevin Hines. If you've never heard of Kevin Hines, he is a guy who did attempt suicide when he was younger. His story will knock your socks off. He, he, he survived jumping off the Golden Gate Bridge and he lived to tell and he does go around telling his story. And what his main story is, is that he gave signs and he was kind of reaching out for help in a way. He was crying on the back of a bus for 45 minutes and nobody approached him. And he, he made this contract with himself. He said, if, some, if just one person asks me what's wrong, I'm not gonna jump, I'm not gonna jump. And nobody did, so he jumped. That's the thing, they, he says um, that, that people a lot of times make that kind of contract with themselves. You know, if just one person asks, I'm not gonna follow through. And you could be that person that asks this one question very simply, you have a conversation, you're showing that you care and it, and it could prevent them from doing what they do. 
who's in this comment kind of goes along with that, but it says some people are having suicidal feelings, but are reluctant to talk about them because they also think that it, that it is wrong. They are ashamed that they are even thinking about it. So true. And again, it comes back to that your reaction to it could form how they, how much they share with you or don't share. If you have that totally negative tone of voice and, oh my gosh, I can't believe Joe took his life and left his family that way. That's so selfish. You know, of course, they're not going to share with you if they're having these feelings. And you just never know who's having the feelings like that. I think we've learned that with so many movie stars and maybe people we know who've taken their life that we never would have imagined that they were having those kinds of feelings. So what if they say yes? Do not leave them alone. That's the number one thing. If you, if you take anything away from this workshop, I hope that's it. Don't leave someone alone if they, if they are showing signs of suicide tendencies. And call for some help that's appropriate. Um, a lot of times, a friend or a family member might not be appropriate because they might not know how to deal with it appropriately. They might not, they could be even contributing to it. You know, it's best to get them with someone who knows what they're doing, a counselor, someone at a hospital, even call 911 if you have to, if it gets to that point. Emergency services uh, can help. Yes. Someone would like to know what you should do if this comes up over the phone. Here's an example of what someone did in Nebraska just recently. They shared with me their story after taking a course um, that we offered through Extension. Uh, they called the police department in that town and they asked them to do a wellness check. And apparently that's a, a well-known thing in all police departments. If you call and say, hey, I, someone's distressed, I'm worried about them, could you please do a wellness check? The officers will go to that person's home and check up on him. In this case, um, they caught him just in time. And later that evening, about 11 o'clock in the evening, he posted on a social media site. He said, to whoever called the cops tonight, thank you, you saved my life. If that isn't powerful, I don't know what is. Um, it's, it's one way to do it. That's, that's what I would recommend is, is a wellness check or maybe someone who is near them um, that you could call to, to go be with them because you just don't want them to be alone. It's when they're alone that bad things happen. So in review, we learned about farmers can have stress due to experiencing all of those weather-related conditions and other things, and they may not seek help um, in part due to lack of resources. We learned that chronic stress is a common response to challenging economic conditions that farmers face. We learned that empathy is the most helpful thing you can do for someone going through extreme stress. And you don't say, well, at least, I was guilty of that a lot before this. Positive self-talk, mindful breathing, and acceptance are proven coping skills. And they're very simple coping skills that anyone can do. So they are highly recommended. And last but definitely not least, never leave a distressed person alone. Call. See, I, I disagree a little bit when Michigan State says call a friend or family member, I say call someone, a professional who knows what to do and who knows what to help and maybe a friend or family member to help um, guide that process. So this is not the end, by the way. We threw this slide in a little bit early this time because we found that people don't like taking evaluations and we really want you to do the evaluation. So Ryan's gonna put that in the chat now and probably we'll have him do it later. We just wanna make sure you, you give us an evaluation on the program, but we are going to give you some helpful resources here first. So these are some important national resources. And again, you can get the slides for this presentation um, that, that will have this whole list. You don't need to write all these letters down, but um, gosh, so many. Center for Rural Affairs, Rural Affairs, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. They also have a text line, which works pretty slick if, if people don't want to talk and they just want to text. The Veterans Crisis Line is great. Um, American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. And I threw on here the AgriSafe Learning Lab because they are putting more and more resources for mental health on their site. In Nebraska, we have some really great sites that we usually spend some time on, but we are not going to spend that much time on them today because many of you are not from Nebraska. This is our number one that we recommend. It's the Rural Response Hotline um, that can help with 
any situation that any farmer or rancher has, and they offer some free vouchers to help with that situation. So if you are from Nebraska, I would highly recommend that one. We also have a program for um, people who are left after a loved one takes their own life. And this, this is a bunch of professionals that they go out in pairs and they, um, they go to the person who is left alone and um, talk to them and it, it reduces their chance of taking their own life. Um, statistically, it really does work. We have the Nebraska Strong Recovery Project doing great things in our communities, especially those communities that have had disaster situations. We have our Nebraska Family Helpline for any problem, any time, 24 hours a day. And this is our site that we wanted to share with you all. This is where you will find the resources from today. If you click on resources and communicating with farmers under stress, you'll find a whole bunch of Michigan State flyers and, and handouts and things that could be helpful for you. So I think Ryan is putting that one in the link in the chat box. And there's there's some other things. We have some great videos here. We have some podcasts. We just keep adding to it almost daily. We we've, we've really built this up in the last two years. And we're pretty, we're pretty proud of it. What was that? I heard something. Okay. And this is another thing we want to share with you uh, as an idea for maybe what you can do in your state. This is what we have done. We have created this resource list with our best uh, resources that we've handed out to a lot of bankers. We, we, we've printed this out and they can keep it in their desk drawer. You know, a lot of ag lenders have to deal with some really sticky situations. And this is handy to have at their desk. Just if they, if they come across someone who is really stressed out, they can hand them this sheet. If they don't know what else to say or what else to do, they can hand them this sheet. And the same way with those cards, Glennis mentioned these wallet cards. I have a picture up there in the top. These have been our bread and butter. We've handed out 32,000 of these and, and still going strong and in Spanish as well. These are great for farmers and ranchers because they are discreet. They can put them in their wallet and that's what we tell them. And there's a picture of us at our booth at Husker Harvest Days. And we just stood there and you can see that guy was just sharing a heartfelt story with me. Um, we had so many people sharing stories about mental health because we were there to talk about it. And it was so cool. And everyone accepted those cards. Nobody refused. They all took out their wallets They put them in their wallets or we said, put it in your visor. And then if you have a friend who's struggling later, you can give it to them when really what we meant is, you know, maybe you could use it for yourself too, but that way they weren't too proud to take it. And I think everybody appreciated it. We had so many comments. So I would highly recommend doing a wallet card like that. They've been really successful for us. And these are just some more recommended resources. I won't go over all these because you can get those in our notes, but we do want you to consider now, do you feel more able to deal with a farmer or a rancher who might be experiencing extreme stress? I sure, Hope you are, and I hope you will um, go to that evaluation site to let us know if you feel a little bit better about it. That really helps us, and it helps us, um, you know, as we as we do this program over and over. It helps us evolve and make it better. So that's what we're hoping to get from you. And Glennis, did I miss anything? Can you think of anything else that we need to add to this? No. It just always a pleasure to work with you on this presentation. I had the picture of Husker Harvest Days, um, and that was kind of when we first got the cards out, started getting those out and so on. But that was in 2019 when we could be face-to-face. -face. <laughs> they didn't even have the event yeah. in 2020. So we're looking forward to, uh, you know, meeting people again face-to-face -face this next year. I think that's, you know, the best way when you're trying to work with and deal with someone and all the stressors yeah. that we have. So. It's funny. I just added that picture just yesterday. And when I put it, I had to do a double take. It's like, wow, I was that close to a human being. <laughs> I don't remember doing that for a whole year. That's crazy. So someone just asked if they can get the resource list. And yes, that is in our, in, on the website under resources. Glennis, help me. I think, I think there's a tab under resources called communicating with farmers under stress. And then you can find all those resources and it's probably called the staying connected pdf i believe is what it's called yeah i'll look really quickly but also the slides there should be a copy of it may not be exact yeah. these slides but um 
definitely a site of the program if you're interested. In yeah, anything. and I can always so, email anything. You know, there's our email addresses. I, I'd be happy to email whatever you request. So we have only about three minutes left. Are there any questions? Everyone's just commenting, wonderful job. And then this was the fastest hour and a half that they've experienced in a work, workshop. <laughs> so great job, guys. Yay, that's what we want to hear. Thank you. And again, I beg you, please do our evaluation because that this is what extension goes by is evaluation. So we really appreciate it when you complete those for us. Okay, so those resources, uh, Ryan, you, Ryan's been working on our website update. Um, I think it's under the four ag professionals tab and there it's called communicating with farmers under stress. If you click on that, then you'll see program handouts further down. And also um, Susan's gonna do another one of these on May 5th. So we try to keep, keep you updated as to when we're doing these programs. So if you have other folks that um, you want to share this with, let them know to join us in one of our future webinars and pretty much the same content. And you know, I like say Susan and I, we've done it a number of times, but I, and I still say this, I learn mm -hmm. and I'm reminded of what I can do better each time I go through teaching one of these courses. And so, and as Susan said, we have repeat customers. We have people that come back um, because it's one of those topics that, you know, um, you know, it's just a good reminder. It makes us stop and think a little bit about how we approach uh, folks that we see from day to day. So, so hopefully you can find those handouts, okay. There was a note from Eileen Murphy. I'm Eileen, I believe that the presentation will be available later on the AgriAbility website as well as a video of oh, this okay. session. So mm -hmm. you should have that. And I think Susan had to send her um, information there or the PowerPoint or Glenn has sent it to Tess as well. So I think it'll all be together. Yep. All right, well with that, I guess we will end it. Look at us, Glennis. 129 right on time. Oh. <laughs> yeah, we can awesome. hang on a few minutes if there's more questions yeah. or comments from anybody. But thank you for taking time and and again giving us some feedback and our evaluations. We have to report um, you know, kind of what we're doing and if we're doing good things or not. So right. <laughs> and I'm just gonna finish today by again, thank you everyone for joining us. There are a couple links. Hello. Yep, you're there. Okay, sorry. Please follow the link in the chat box to answer the evaluation questions about today's session. So you'll note that there is one evaluation that is just for Susan and Glennis's presentation for their records, as well as um, one from Tess that she posted from the Purdue website. So please make sure to fill both of those out. Um, you can all use the same Zoom link that you use today for all of the upcoming Tuesday sessions. Next week's session is low cost farm assistive technology with Jeff, um, not sure how to say his last name, so I'm not gonna butcher it. From Jeff K. Easter, <laughs> from Easter Seals, Wisconsin and Wisconsin Agrivility at one. And if you have any questions, please contact Tess at, and her email address is listed there. But again, thank you everyone. They appreciate it so much. Thank you, all of you who presented today. We appreciate it. Thanks for having us. We always enjoy.